So do we just go down the line and introduce ourselves? Constance, do you yeah. want to start? Hi. <laughs> I'm Constance Sayers. I am the author of uh, two novels, A Witch in Time, uh, that came out right at the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, The Ladies of the Secret Circus, which came out in March of this year, and I'm working on a third book um, uh, that will come out in 2023. Hi everyone, I'm Dorothy Fleco, author of the New York Times bestselling fantasy Raybearer, and its sequel, Redemptor, which just came out this week. Um, I am really, <laughs> it's, it feels really strange to do in-person events because both of these were pandemic releases, um, but yeah. I'm Leslie, I write as a Penelope. I write fantasy and paranormal romance. My fantasy series is Ursina Chronicles. Uh, there are four books. The fourth one came out this past Tuesday. It starts with Song of Blood and Stone. And I've got bookmarks um, here. So I've had two pandemic releases, the last two books of the series. <laughs> Lots of fun. Hi, I'm Peter B. Brett. I'm author of the internationally best-selling Demon Cycle series from Delray Books. Uh, the Demon Cycle is complete in five books and made is ready. Um, but I have just released the first book in my new Nightfall Saga, uh, The Desert Prince, which came out two weeks ago, so it is my first pandemic release. <laughs> just going to judge each other by that, I guess. Uh, my name is Jay Kelly Scavrin. I am writing here under John Scavrin. Uh, this is my second trilogy with Orbit. The first one, The Empire of Storms, started with Hope and Red, and that was about swashbuckling kung fu pirates. Um, and this one is more of a Slavic-tinged fantasy, uh, very like brooding and you know Slavic, um, just like my grandmother would have wanted. Um, <laughs> and it's called the Goddess War. The first one, Ranger of Marzana, and, and Queen of Ismeros just came out last spring. Um, the third one is due out the following spring. And these are both also pandemic books. Mm -hmm. it's a little club. <laughs> so we should talk about our worlds. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Before we start, let's go back down the other way. So, John, sure, sure, sure. Well, we, we just, oh, I'm sorry okay. to interrupt, but, but um, since we don't have a moderator, we'll probably take some questions at the end, so maybe start thinking about those now while we talk. You can write them down. Sorry about that. No, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good idea. We should probably, is someone, is someone keeping an eye on time? Uh, I will set a little timer and give us 15 minutes at the end that sounds to long. take questions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what was the question again? Tell us about your world. Oh, worlds, yeah. So, um, uh, this is what we would call uh, second world fantasy, um, which is that it's not anything to do with our world. I mean, it is, because it inevitably it must be. But, um, but it's set in a separate, completely separate world, like, you know, the Lord of the Rings books are in second world fantasy, because that's not anything like what we know. Um, there's no, you know, like, England or, you know, China or wherever. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that I particularly enjoyed doing with the first trilogy, The Empire of Storms, um, was I wanted, like, uh, I basically created my own uh, slang, I guess. Um, you know, because it's a lot of lower class folks, it's loosely based on early um, New York City crime culture, like the gang, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Gangs of New York, just, like, that's actually based off a non-fiction book. Um, sort of non-fiction. Um, and that, that movie is only one chapter in a very big and comprehensive book, and there's a lot of fun stuff in there. Um, but yeah, so I, I kind of based a lot of it off of that, and I guess I do keep doing that over and over again. I say second world fantasy, and it's a whole other thing, but like, there's always some kernel from somewhere else, you know what I mean? Like this one, like, yeah, it's second world fantasy, but it's definitely Poland. <laughs> like, it's definitely <laughs> Poland, uh, and because, what started me writing it was this um, researching my, my uh, ancestral homeland and finding out that Poland literally did not exist as a sovereign nation for over a hundred years. And like, what does that do to a people? Like, like, what does that do to a culture that you know ceases to exist? That basically was carved up by Russia, Prussia, and a couple other folks. Um, you know, like, and I was really interested in exploring that. Um, and so that's kind of what led to the, this series. And do you just want to jump right in, or do you want to just... Yeah. Sure, uh, my apologies everyone. I'm actually the moderator for this okay. panel. Um, I, I apologize, I was at my own table uh, selling to some cute little kids, and you can't leave cute little kids <laughs> in the lurch, right? So, uh, my sincere apologies for being late. I'm Emily S. Witten. We are on the How to Build a Fantasy World panel. I appreciate everyone kind of jumping in since I was running late. Uh, if we have 
haven't done all the introductions yet, I'll just do mine really quickly. I am the co-creator and writer of this graphic novel series, The Underfoot, about intelligent hamsters who live in a post-apocalyptic Washington, D.C., where all the humans have disappeared, possibly our own fault. And uh, in this book, the hamsters have special skills and abilities, and they use them to survive, also using like human science and history, and uh, you know, weaving that together into a sci-fi saga. Uh, who has introduced themselves? Yeah. All right, great. <laughs> I'm assuming everyone could hear me because I'm really loud, but now I have a mic and I don't have to yell. So since we've gone through the basics of who everyone is, um, one of the things that I find fascinating about creating a world is doing the research to... <laughs> I might have <laughs> it's actual magic, probably. Um, so one of the things I find interesting is the research that um, you know I put into my world building. And even if you're writing something in science fiction or fantasy, you might be basing some of that in experiences you've had or real world situations. So I'd love to hear from our authors um, as to how they might build up their knowledge before or during the creation of the story. If we want to start at Vincent, you can kind of run down the line. So, um, I write, I, I was telling John earlier, I, I, I tend to write um, just as much in horror and in um, romantic fantasy as I, or, or, or romantic, historical romance as I do kind of in traditional fantasy. So, um, both of my books, uh, for me it was kind of a, I started with this book, which I ended up writing four timelines because I was so stupid I didn't realize how hard that was. And so I wrote like Belle Epoque Paris, I wrote, you know, um, Hollywood in the 1940s, Taos in the 1970s during like Easy Rider and then Modern Day Washington. And when you're, like when I'm doing, like, you know, um, historical panels, everyone's really, you know, talking about the history and the historical research. I found that I kind of would do what I could and then I would, and then I would kind of, you know, invent what I could, because you're basically world building. Uh, your world building in different times because there's really no way to actually go back and figure out how the 1940s and the Belle Epoque Paris looked. So I kind of uh, kind of cut my teeth on that. Um, and then uh, when I began writing Ladies of the Secret Circus, um, it was Paris 1925. I'm very committed to writing about France, the historical France. However, I decided that I may or may not be writing about a, a circus that is in the seventh layer of hell. And so that began, you know, I mean, I've read a lot about witches and demons, and it became kind of a, um, almost like an Alice in Wonderland. I approached it very much like Alice in Wonderland, in which you have somebody who kind of gets immersed in this world. And then I began, as she was seeing the world, I began the whole process then of creating um, how the origins of the circus came to be, which I think become as, as important as the actual circus. I tend to approach my worlds, though, very much like an art director. Um, they are very visual, they are very cinematic. I start with almost like a painterly perspective of when, what this thing is going to look like. What it's going to look like to me is really, really important, almost to like a Tim Burton kind of way. Both of my books, I think, um, are that way. And then I begin to sketch, you know, so what I did was I basically sketched out a circus act. And then from the circus act, then I, then I started to just heighten what I thought was kind of the, you know, the, the strangeness of the world and the origins of the world. Um, and so while it is based, you know, I mean, you have Paris in 1925, this thing really steps off and you, like I said, you really are in what my perception of the seventh layer of hell is like overlooking the sticks. And so, I mean, and it's got like, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's a combination of like the leap of, of, of details that are, you know, very different, but then also kind of concrete details that people recognize from the circus. So there's an anchor to it. I'm not, you know, like writing in a, in a high fantasy different world completely. Um, and so for me, it, it was a combination of those things that were, 
um, tangible that you knew and that you understood, and then things I think that really kind of like jumped into um, a different dimension and you know a very very different dimension. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> it's very it's very it's very interesting and helpful. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I guess I should start with the premise of Ray Bear books. Um, Ray Bear is set in a magically hewn Pangea mega continent. So all of them were individual continents um, that were kind of soldiered together by one person, one warlord who then named himself Emperor. And from his lineage, um, there's this divine blessing, meaning that all of the succeeding emperors um, are more or less immortal because for every person they anoint to their sacred council of 11, um, they become immune to one kind of death. Um, all until they're immune to all deaths except old age. The catch is that anybody they anoint to this council can still murder them. So if I anointed Constance, I might become immune to drowning, but Constance can still drown me. <laughs> um, so um, in order to keep these emperors safe and make sure their council members never betray them. These people, their, these council members are chosen with their children and they grow up with the future emperor and become mentally and psychologically bonded to the emperor and to each other to the point that they can't spend any time apart without getting ill and eventually going bad. Um, so the protagonist is a young girl sent by her mother, a mysterious woman known only as the lady to be a plant on the future emperor's council, to go through the rigorous process, to join his council, genuinely love him, be loved back, and then to murder him when she has that ability by being anointed. Um, I think when it comes to world building, I generally always start with the people and what they revere and what they fear. The earliest versions of Raybearer actually happened 200 years after this main character, whose name is Tari Sai, um, died. They, they, I originally envisioned this as this um, empire of people looking back on this girl, um, Tari Sai, the just, who they just revered and worshipped and had statues of. And um, I didn't, I, the only thing I really knew at the time when I started was that she wasn't the she wasn't a goddess, she wasn't really. At this point, people think she was. They give her this kind of reverence, but I always knew in my heart she was just an ordinary person. And so the more I tried to write that story um, of the mythology of these people looking back, the more I realized that her story was the one I actually wanted to tell. <laughs> so I stepped back 200 years and just told her story instead. Um, I think that Going off of um, cultural reverence and fears is a good way to start. I, another way to start world building, any setting, but especially fantasy is from an economic perspective. If you can figure out what is scarce and what is plentiful and who has access to what is scarce and why, how did it become scarce in the first place? Um, do people revere the people who have the scarce resource? That's usually what happens in economic systems, right? Um, the scarce resource could be a source of magic, like in this book, um, the ray bearers have access to this divine ability to bond all these people to themselves and to be immortal. Um, they also have access to um, a treaty with the underworld that keeps demons from coming up and kind of ravaging the entire mega continent. Um, so they naturally kind of get to be at the top of this pecking order until things happen in this story that challenges kind of those roles in the traditional ways they're held. Um, I think that for me, for this series in particular, it was, even though it's a massive alternate fantasy world, um, it was really important to me to code each of these cultures to real world cultures because I actually started this series when I was 13. I was a nerdy little black girl who loved a genre that didn't love me back very much. Um, and I think that when I started, because I've never seen fantasies that starred people that look like me, um, I didn't feel like I had permission to write a fantasy like that. So at first, all the cultures were super vague. Like, everyone had these like Afro-Latin names and 
kind of these formless robes, and the climate was kind of Oregon where I lived at the time, and kind of not, um, until I got to college and kind of was just like, screw that. Like, <laughs> and I went the opposite extreme, which was to get super specific. Like, it's, you know, the um, ruling culture is directly based on the Yoruba of West Africa. It's surrounded by cultures based on the Kukuyu of East Africa, the Shona of Southeastern Africa, um, the Joseon period of Korea, the Han Chinese, um, the Gauls of a certain region of Western Europe. Like, it just gets super, super specific instead in terms of coding. Um, and it was really fun, but there are 13 culturally distinct realms in this series. And researching those to make sure that even the fantasy versions of them were respectful um, and accurate in the ways that I needed them to be was a lot of work. <laughs> Especially looking at sources from pre-colonial African empires, which were beautiful and massive and intricate, but because of colonization, access to sources on what those places were like were hard to come by. Um, but they're there if you want them, and there are people who will talk to you, and when all else fails, there's a subscription to JSTOR, <laughs> which is what I ended up doing for some of it. So um, my world of the Ursino Chronicles is an alternate 1920s world, so it's second world fantasy. But I wanted guns and cars and telephones, and I didn't want to deal with horse travel and all of that. I don't like horses. <laughs> so I didn't want to research them. Uh, but I did start my world with geography and climate because the initial idea I had, I had this image in my head that inspired the entire series, uh, was of a girl on her porch with a shotgun as these enemies were coming to her isolated cabin where she lived alone. And so I knew that I had two groups of people that hated each other and I needed to know why. And as, it, as I wrote the very first draft, um, they had been at war for 500 years, and I needed to understand why one of them hadn't conquered uh, the other sooner. There was a magical barrier in place. So I started with the geography of the land, and that like, there was a mountainous desert region, and there was more of a, like a farm country, basically. And so the people in the desert wanted the resources, and there was a, mount, there was a mountain barrier between them. And so everything started from there, and then I went into the economics and culture and things like that. I also had, um, you know, like Jordan, I, I wanted my characters to be diverse, and my main characters are black. In fantasy, when I was actually first writing this, I was in a, in a writing group, and, um, you know, I was the only black person in the group, and so the default of, of literature is white. You're assuming the character is white until they tell you otherwise. And I wanted to make sure that in my books, the default is black. So I'm gonna, you're gonna assume the character is black until I tell you otherwise. And that's how I came, came at that. Other things I researched, um, instead of doing analogs to existing cultures, I really wanted to do mashups. So I didn't want anything that was identifiable as a real, you know, a real world culture. But I wanted to look at like the desert culture, the people who lived in the desert. You know, I researched desert cultures from all over the world and found similarities and then built my culture off of that so that it could be something completely new and separate and I like the idea that fantasy, you can, it can show you a mirror to our world, but without the baggage that our world has. So I have black characters, but there's no Africa, there's no slave trade, but there's still racial prejudice and there's magical prejudice. One group of people has magic, the other group doesn't. That's another reason why they hate each other. So the other thing I was really concerned about was like, yeah, why do people fight? Why have they been at war? What is beyond resources and food and water? You know, why do they actually hate each other? What is, um, you know, what is so abhorrent about these other people? I do have a, a lot of cultures uh, throughout the series, different countries, and each country has distinct cultures, and then I had to figure out like migration patterns. Like, okay, there's three races in one of my countries. Where did they come from? How did they all come to, be, to live together? And then what's the history of that? If not everybody has to fight because of race, there's all kinds of things that human beings fight over. So trying to expand the reasons why we hate each other also, just to explore them a little bit. Um, and have, you know, there's some cultures or some countries where being gay is, is not accepted and there's other countries where it is. So I really wanted to have just a breadth of experiences and diversity so that people could read the book and see maybe struggles that they've had themselves in some cases, but also an imagining of what it would be like not to have those struggles and to have maybe other struggles and have other reasons why people either love each other or hate each other. Um, and then other research topics were just trying to be uh, accurate to sort of an early 20th century time period. 
So even though it's, it's a fantasy world, and I, I didn't have to be completely accurate, I still wanted it to be close. So I was researching technology, like radios and you know telephones and how, how it actually worked. There was one, one day when I was just like, so in 1925, for example, how did long distance telephone calls work? You know, like I wanted to know that because it's just making a long distance call. In the very first chapter of the first book, Song of Blood and Stone, the character, you know, there's a new telephone in the post office and she's never used it before and she has to make a call. And so that was why. Like, that's actually part, one of the fun parts about research, where you can just dive into a, a rabbit hole and learn something new. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I approached it. Um, so I taught myself to write in a way that a lot of young nerds do. Um, I wrote stories about my D&D character. <laughs> um, and I ended up writing three novels um, about this character. And uh, as D&D novels go, I think they were probably pretty good. Um, but what I came to realize is that that D&D world that those of us who are familiar with it recognize so easily is not um, a mainstream reader coming into that is not going to understand a lot of the things that, that people who are in the genre take for granted, like what a mage is, the difference between a paladin and a ranger. Like, and so I wanted my books to be accessible to everyone, not just to people who are already in the genre. And so when I realized that I couldn't do that with the books that I'd already written, I started from scratch again, and I started to think about what are things that everyone has in common? Cultures that, that uh, grew up completely separate from each other, what do they all have in common? What can I do that will create a sort of shared experience that everybody will be able to relate to? And the things that I focused on were fear of the dark, fear that there are monsters in the dark, and magical symbols to protect you from those monsters. Because almost every culture in the world has those things. Um, <coughs> And I wanted a magic system that was more based in hard work and practice than it was in just being born the chosen one. Because I wanted people's experiences, I, you know, like as Leslie said, like the second world we create should have the same problems and reflect some of the same experiences that we have so that readers can relate even if it's done in a completely different way. Um, and so I built this world where Demons come out at night, as soon as the sun comes out, the sets, demons come out, and they basically just ravage the land and hunt and kill everything. Um, not dissimilar to what Jordan was talking about. Um, and the only way to protect yourself is to draw these magical symbols called wards around your crops, around your home, uh, to, that the demons can't pass through, sort of like holding a cross up to a vampire. Um, and these symbols are relatively fragile. If you draw it wrong, or if it gets messed up or covered somehow, the demons have an opening and can get in. And so, in this world, like people would uh, work all day, make sure the wards are good, get inside at night, and hide. And hide with the very real knowledge that if they screwed something up, they're going to die tonight. And I wanted to talk about like, what does that pervasive fear do to people? How does it make them treat each other? How does that make them feel about themselves? Like, uh, and that was sort of the, the baseline premise for this world. Um, and then I had these isolated communities that, you know, these walled communities that uh, had been around for hundreds of years since the demons returned. And it was very hard to get from one to the other. So there were, only, there were like messengers who would brave the lands in between to carry messages and packages and whatever. But for the most part, these were very isolated places, and so I was able to create distinct cultures in each one of these cities, and then as the story starts, we get to visit them and see how those different cultures um, relate to each other. Um, and then, so that way, the, the story could start with very low magic um, and escalate a little bit with each book, so that by book five, when people can fly and throw lightning bolts and things like that, the reader understands it because it happened very gradually and very slowly as new magics were discovered and you learned how they were applied. And, and um, at the same time, there are these cultural conflicts going on. Um, a lot of those books were written um, during like the, the early 2000s when we were starting multiple wars for, for very um, specious reasons. Um, and I wanted to sort of 
keep an experience of like, okay, here's one side of the war, and here's how they feel about how things are going on, and how they feel about the, their enemies. And then, in the second book, I took the person you thought was the villain in the first book, and I introduced you to them as a child, and you watch them grow up, and you watch them trying to save the world, and trying to, to do the best thing they can for their people, so that when you read the conflict again, from their perspective, you have a whole different view of it. And so I thought that that um, would reflect the way our world, you know, how America in particular um, would pick a fight without really understanding who they were picking a fight with, and not doing the research and not taking the time to respect the fact that people have things in common. And um, so I wanted to talk about that in my books and reflect other real world problems. So my world is a completely fictional world, but it has, it has most of the same problems we have in our world so that you can relate to the characters' experiences. I would like to say as someone who read a different book that was entirely like you were just reading a D&D &D campaign, I thoroughly appreciate <laughs> recognizing that that's not necessarily the best book to read. And I think the research really grounds the story in something greater than that. I will say, though, that I, that I learned to write by doing that, mm -hmm. and that I don't consider that work wasted. I just don't ever want anyone to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you publish the module? Uh, you know, I actually have one, and I don't, I don't want anyone to read that either. <laughs> So as I was kind of uh, getting to uh, earlier, um, uh, the first book is, is very heavily set on kind of a, a fantasy Poland um, and kind of what happens to a culture after it's been not a culture anymore, um, or not a country at least. Um, and so uh, kind of going off what a lot of people said, like as the trilogy goes, you kind of experience out to all kind of corners of the continent and there are multiple countries in each one own culture, each one has its own religion, each one has its own form of magic, and you know, it's a lot to kind of juggle and you don't want to give any short shrift to any of it. Um, and so that, that, it gets complicated, but it's also, it's the, it is the complication that I find probably the most fascinating. Um, and you know, with like economics and stuff, the way this whole thing fell out is that there's a, there was a country right in the middle of the uh, continent that had like all of the agriculture like all of it, like they had just like bounteous food and everything you could ever want, whereas, you know, up in the north you've got this like, you know, not a lot of agriculture, it's pretty poor, um, you know, and to the, to the east there's lots of bogs and swamps and it took a little while to kind of get going, and then, you know, um, in the south, they're, they were just, a, uh, um, they're, this country of the east is like, their magic is art-based. I always wanted to make it art-based magic. Like, like it's all about like painting and music and singing and dancing and all that. I just, I just always wanted to do that. Um, and because they're all a bunch of artists, they're like, eh, you know, we're not super into like conquering and stuff. Um, <laughs> so this country in the middle is kind of perfectly primed, and they just expand out in all directions. And they're like, oh, we give you some sovereignty. We're not, you know, but but they ban languages, they ban cultures, they ban religions. You know, um, and so these cultures begin to erode, um, and that's how they have been doing at the beginning of the first book. Um, and it's it's basically these various kind of countries coming together, and these various cultures trying to find ways to work together to take down the large empire that's come up in the middle, uh, which is very loosely based. Um, but you know, you pick and choose these things. Like I can say, well, it's kind of the Roman Empire, but it's also kind of like the Tsarist Russian Empire, like in in some ways. Um, just like it's Poland, but it's not Poland, and you know, it's Spain, but it's not Spain, and you know, uh, and it's Germany, but it's not Germany. You know, so all of these things, you kind of you you want to you do a, a a lot of research, most of which will never be doesn't show up on the page. Um, but but if nothing else for your own peace of mind that you're you know doing your due diligence and that you are respecting the inspiration that it came from and I mean if you can talk to some actual folks from those places that's even better I, I have to be really lucky um, I have a childhood friend from Spain um, and I, you know and who was also very generous um, and, and you know flew me out to hang out with them and, and, and her family and you know what I mean? So like I, I've gotten to kind of like really steep myself in some of those cultures. Um, obviously it's not possible always. Um, you know, the next best thing is to like, you know, um, 
watch a lot of stuff, read a lot of stuff, and, and kind of really immerse yourself into it. Um, and language can be tricky too. I, I, I always am fond of, of using languages. Like they don't actually, the, the, the Poland, they actually use Russian because I, my grandmother won't, I'm not sure if I roll it over grade, but I, I actually don't much care for the Polish language. Um, I, think <laughs> Russian sounds, I think Russian sounds much prettier. Uh, I'm a huge fan of like Tolstoy and, and Chekhov and all those folks, and I just love the ridiculously long names and all of that stuff. So they actually speak Russian. The, the original language that's supposed to have been abolished is, is based on Russian. And we did that with a couple of different countries, but when we got to Spain, my editor was like, you know, it sounds really weird when we've got all these exotic sounding languages, and then they're like, hola, que tal? <laughs> you know? And, and, and it was like, we didn't want it to not be Spanish because, you know, I mean, that was very clearly what the culture was based on, and it seemed weird to go otherwise, but um, but because Spanish is a super basic language in the States, like, it just felt too familiar. It didn't feel very fantasy, you know? Um, and so what we ended up doing, uh, and this was actually my editor's, uh, Angelina Rodriguez, this was actually her suggestion, I'm so grateful because it ended up being so cool, is we reverse engineered a kind of precursor Spanish language in the same way that, like, in English, you know, there's, like, ye old English where things are spelled differently and that kind of stuff and said slightly differently. We actually did took some of the traces of where Spanish came from, Latin from some other places, and we kind of reverse engineered our own ye old Spanish. Um, and that's what they actually speak in the in the books. And I've got like a comprehensive dictionary of what all the words are and everything. But it's a, I, I really enjoy that sort of thing. So Thank you, and uh, I, I will, uh, we're gonna open it up to questions in a minute, but I'll briefly share. I've written in both fantasy and sci-fi, these happen to be sci-fi stories, but um, as everyone was saying, research is, you know, kind of something that will ground your story, and also, sometimes you luck into a childhood friend or having worked in a government agency for a long time, in fact, in several government agencies, and so in my books, uh, one of the premises is that the characters may have come from some sort of government experimentation, and uh, it's also grounded right here in the DC area because I've lived here for a long time. So some of the research, especially the science, comes from me pouring over you know, the different science things and consulting with like a mechanical engineer and, a, and different kinds of scientists and everything. But a lot of the um, world building that other people might have to research just was easy for me because you know it was things I was already living. Um, and I will just share one little story about how that can make things easier if you've got either a lot of research that goes into your story or the knowledge from your own lived experience. Um, this book was uh, already written when COVID happened, but the interstitial pages that kind of bring the real world science industry into it had not been fully completed. We had one extra page and I said, I'm gonna do a government org chart, which is the nerdiest thing that you can ever imagine. But what I did was the, the government organization that is in the book got an org chart, and the bottom half of the chart includes several component agencies that I wish we had had at the beginning of this pandemic. <laughs> so things to do with family wellness, mental health, you know, nationwide health, uh, you know, testing and things like that, that we unfortunately don't have enough systems in place for, have made their way into the story. And I was able to do that fairly easily based on my own lived experience and research that was done because of my work. So uh, I, I really do think that world building is, is really important and research makes that world feel real. So let's open it up to some questions. Someone raise, uh, I see a hand right there, orange mask. Um, how much of your research is before pen hits paper, and how much do you do kind of along the way? Okay, anyone feel free to jump in on any of these questions. <coughs> the answer is, oh. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's fun to like get, when you have a conception of a world, it's fun to kind of gather resources because sometimes the research itself will give you ideas. Um, I, that's happened to me so many times. Um, like one of my favorite discoveries was that like in the mythologies of West African genealogies, you know, they have real kings and real empires, but there's another layer of storytelling that kind of elevate those same figures to um, kind of divine beings. So like some of it is history and some of it is storytelling. 
and there's this wonderful custom between like rival kings. I think it was like in the Mali and Songhe empires where they would intimidate each other to form battle by basically having a rap battle <laughs> via a magic owl. <laughs> like the owl would go and deliver the bars <laughs> to the other king and be like, oh yeah, well my soldiers, we're gonna go in there. <laughs> You're gonna wet yourself, it's gonna be like, yeah. No, seriously. And I was just like, things like that, things you discover, I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, like I, th I think that might be like that specific custom, like rap battles by owls didn't make it into these books, which I, regret to this day. <laughs> but it's stuff like that, right? Where it's just like, you know, another example is, um, and this, I, someone said that a lot of the research you do doesn't actually make it into the book. Um, since these are all based on culturally distinct real world realms, um, I did a lot of research on um, ancient Mayan empires for a nation in, this, in these books called Ketsala. And out of all that research, one of the only things that made it in, because you don't get to see this culture very much, is that their king basically has like a grill made of jewels. Because ancient Mayans, if they were wealthy, they would embed their teeth with the jewels. Um, and you still find it in the skulls to this day. So it's, it's both and. I think that depending on your personality, you can get a little too caught up with the research to keep you from writing. Um, <laughs> And we all know those. That. No, we all know those no. people. <laughs> yeah, and you should let that happen. But um, it is always a good idea to stop and do research if you're trying to create a world and you either have writer's block or you're just auto filling it in with we yeah, whatever. Like I, I want to say the standard, and unfortunately it is where it's just like this very basic Eurocentric like. All, all castles look like King Arthur castles, all countries look kind of like Lord of the Rings, like just without giving a lot of thought to that climate, why people chose to settle there in particular. Because you know, you could have places like that, but you know, the archetypes for those places still had a lot of research put into them, right? Um, yeah, I think I, that's I, my I will say also that one benefit of writing a series of books is that you might discover, for instance, that you've written characters in book two of your book and then discover a really cool, weird science thing that you didn't even know, but you have another book, so these characters can come back. So one thing is you can do it as you're writing the whole story if you happen to be in a series story. Um, it's hard to say this in a room full of nerds, um, but research is good, but... It's okay to make stuff up too. Like, and don't get so bound up in trying to make, you know, make it real world. If you're writing a fantasy story, and you don't have to make everything real world accurate. I, some of the cultures that I created in my world in the beginning, like I pulled things from real world cultures, but as I put them together, the culture started to take on a life of its own, and I didn't feel a need to reflect something so much that it looked like I was pointing at somebody when I'm writing. Uh, it's okay to make things up too, as long as they are plausible and um, seem to reflect what human nature is like. Yeah, I call that the logical hand wave. You know, if it makes some sort of sense, you can then hand wave it away. <laughs> just, you just make up whatever you want, but if you can justify it somehow in your own head, then if someone comes up to you at a con and is like, why did you do that? You'll be able to answer. Can we get another question? I see in the plaid right there. It's a, it's, a, it's a story for kids that I'm writing, but I've been researching um, the, Nazi the Nazi summer camp that was out in Long Island in the 1930s, and, and frustratingly little is known. Uh, I had to pour through thousands of pages of the Dice Committee reports, and I found a bunch of stuff that's troubling. And, um, and, and I've been trying to, to 
figure out whether I want to aggressively go back to you know, the Holocaust Museum folks or, or whoever, um, local, local historian groups at that time, and like how much do I want to be like, hey guys, did you know that the house you're living in was built on child labor? Did you know that? Someone died right here, you know? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. What do we think, guys? What is our, what is our responsibility, I guess? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when I found something like new in research that I thought I had to tell someone, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research now for my next book, which is a 1925 uh, heist, fantasy heist that takes place in DC. And so I'm doing a lot of historical research about that time period and found really crazy, interesting things. But I don't know, I mean, if it's out there, I don't know that we have as fiction writers a, a responsibility to like increase the breadth of actual historical knowledge because and unless that's your, your focus, unless you are a historian, also writing fiction, we don't, I don't know that we have the skills. You know, we're looking at it for the things we're looking at it for. And um, I, I wouldn't presume that I've discovered this new, brand new thing that no one before me has discovered. I just, you know, I'm looking at it to, to mine for, for ideas and inspiration. Um, but yeah, I think that would be a, kind of a rare, a rare case. I, I think in my case, there, well, it wasn't so much an obligation, <laughs> There were things that I found that um, a lot of, of the black diaspora don't know about their own heritage, and that was intentional. A lot of it was purposely erased due to colonization. There are even, there are even um, instances in which the indigenous stories from West Africa were changed to better suit morality coming in from colonial forces. Um, and I even saw that reflected in some of the sources, which I knew were inaccurate because of earlier sources I'd looked at. There was a, there's a story on Wikipedia that I actually edited and added sources to be like, no, this is actually what this is. Um, real quick, it's like the story of, of common West African mythology. Um, the, there's a in the sky god who centers Orisha to create the world. Um, and the original story, even though there are lots of versions of it, um, all these male spirits tried to like build Earth by itself and ignored Oshun and all her female spirits, and and it didn't work. Like creating the world didn't work until they let them come and have an equal role in that. And the whole point was that we need all of us to be able to like make society and creation. And then once patriarchal standards and colonizers came in, that story was changed to say that actually Oshun and her female spirits were meddling. And it wasn't until they submitted to these male spirits that they could, there could be peace on earth. And I'd seen, all, I'd seen the true story so many times in sources, because by that time I was doing all this research, that like, when I saw the story on Wikipedia reflecting the patriarchal version, I was like, okay, <laughs> this is one version. Now here are five sources to the other version. So just things like that when you are looking at sources that are underrepresented or stories that are underrepresented. I do feel some obligation to help. I, uh, I'll add very quickly that as an attorney, I like to give the answer when people ask me legal questions. It depends. And I think that applies in, uh, we do trainings where that's literally the answer to the questions that people in our own workplace ask us. We're like, it depends. You're going to have to come back with some more facts. But um, my, my view on it is if there's going to be some benefit to the world or yourself or et cetera, as with Jordan's story where you know these different perspectives are being offered, or perhaps if for your own intellect you want to talk further, or if you want to just open a very friendly dialogue, like not, did you know this, but hey, this is something I discovered, um, you know, that sort of thing, then you can approach the potential other experts in the field with the kind of collegial, like, did you know about this? Or you can educate on Wikipedia, because why the heck not? It's Wikipedia. We all have the ability to add to it um, and provide sources. So I really think it depends, but um, I see a lot of benefit come out of collaboration. And so if you you know talk to somebody, either nothing happens from it, or often something good can happen from it. So I apologize that we are out of time. I wish we could go on further. But before we leave, let's run down the line from this to that to this end and tell everyone where you can find uh, you at the con and also in the online or greater world. Um, uh, I think next, I think it's 2051, which is the Solid State Bookstore. Um, we're doing signings, I think most, a lot of us are. Um, and I can be reached at constantsayers.com um, and then at Instagram and Twitter at, at constantsayers. 
I'll also be signing books at Booth 2051. It's near the back of the big um, expo hall at the book fair area. Um, I'm on Twitter as jfweco, um, one word, but I'm not on Twitter as much as I'm on Instagram and TikTok where I'm Jordan Fweco, um, just my name, one word. Um, you can follow me there. Um, right now there is a extended pre-order and purchase campaign for my second book, which is out now. Um, so if you buy my book today, um, you can redeem your order soon for like all this Ray Bear merch, which is really cool. <laughs> So if you haven't, if you've gotten it and you haven't redeemed it, you can head to the link in my bio on Instagram, um, or you can buy it and redeem it before it expires. <laughs> I'll be signing also, and again, here today at 2.30 on the series channel. Um, my website is lpenelope.com, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Leslie Penelope, and it's Leslie with a Y. Why? Uh, I'm also signing a Solid State Books, and we'll be here at 2.30 uh, for another panel. Um, you can find me at peterbbrett.com, or on all social media as Uh, I'm also going to be signing up for this and at the 3.30 panel, and you can find me at johnscoverin.com and someone who is not me definitely at jskelly.com. <laughs> and again, I'm Emily Witten. I'm an artist alley at table C03 and at the Emily ESSE everywhere. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>